<laughs> hey, so uh, go with me to your Bible. You have Bibles, right? You said you had your Bibles or your phones. Uh, go with me to the page, uh, to the book of ne- the page, the screen, book of Jeremiah, chapter 20. Jeremiah, chapter 20. We're going to start in verse number 7. Before we get there, or as you're turning there, I want to set this up for us. Uh, Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament. Yes, we read the Old Testament, and uh, we see Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. Amen. Uh, And and, and Jeremiah is one of the prophets. And in this scriptures that we're going to go into, it's almost kind of like we're going to be watching in on the prophet Jeremiah as he's on the proverbial couch of venting to God, right? He's like in the therapist's office venting about, venting to God about his life. Because as you, you can read in this chapter, in the earlier verses, uh, he, he's, life is getting kind of hard for him. You know, God has given him, as a prophet of God, God is telling him what to say, and he is telling only what God says. But the, the problem is, it's not good news. It's not good news. So the people of Israel... And specifically in these, in these verses, the, the leaders of the temple are not happy. It's, it's kind of like an egg on the face to the leaders of the temple, what Jeremiah is saying about what's going to happen and all the stuff that is being, uh, being allowed to happen, it's not good. And so uh, in, earlier in this chapter, Jeremiah got beat up and put in the stocks for saying what God told him to say. So here we are in verse number 7. Now Jeremiah's on the couch venting to counselor Dr. God. Okay? Is that all right? Verse number 7. Oh, Lord. I'm reading out of the NASB. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me, for each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction Because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more his name, talking about God, then my heart, it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in. And I cannot endure it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. We thank you, Jesus, for your word. Lord God, we thank you that it is a light into our feet and it guides our path, Father. Lord, as we come before you tonight, Jesus, I pray that I just am a vessel, that I step aside. I, Antonio, I, the man, step aside. And Holy Spirit, you are our teacher. You are the one who guides. You are the only one that can correct and protect and teach us what we need to know. So as I move aside, Holy Spirit, Jesus, we don't just make room for you, but we give you the room to do what you would. And everybody says, amen. Come on, we need the Holy Spirit up in here, and he is here. Can I tell you? He is here. And so we're excited. We don't want to go any kind of way forward without that. And so now that the Holy Spirit is here, now that we're getting into his word, I believe that God, I know that God has something for you. I know that God doesn't want you to leave this place the same. I know that while you didn't want to come tonight because it was kind of raining and cold and maybe you had a date or something else you could have done, you decided to come here and God has something for you. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, it's for me. Come on, it's for me. It's for me too. It's for me too. Hey, have you ever been in a conversation with someone, right? For some people, that's like new, right? Like maybe a face-to-face conversation, not just through text or maybe in text. Been in a conversation with someone and you guys are just kind of chatting, talking about whatever. And then all of a sudden these words come out. Hey, did you hear that? Or hey, don't say anything but. And as soon as you hear that, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I wasn't quite listening, but what? Huh? You know, you kind of lean in a little bit more, ears perk up. Or, hey, I have a secret i got to tell you. All of a sudden, you're paying attention. Or, or, or maybe the conversation went like, okay, you had the conversation. It was whatever. Then you get home later, and then that text comes. Hey, what I told you earlier was a secret, so don't say anything. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, that's, oh what was it? What was it? See, because there's just something. Uh, and then that kind of like itch comes, right? That, that starts as an itch, and then it's kind of like, man. And then it's kind of like, I just want to tell somebody. Like, I got a secret to tell. I, I, I got, I got, like, I just, oh, man, I just, I, I, there's something exciting. Like, you are in the know, and you, you're just thinking of excuses. I'm kind of telling on myself right now, aren't I? No one wants to talk to me about anything. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm a, I'm a, what do they call it? I'm a vault, right? 
But there's just something about holding a secret. I mean, you know, it makes you feel special, but it's kind of burning inside of you. Like, ah, oh, that's a surprise. I'm going to surprise somebody. Like, who doesn't like telling surprise? Like, you know the person in your life. And if you don't know, it's probably you, the person that you don't want to tell when someone's pregnant or having a surprise party or coming up on a trip or whatever it might be like that. Because it's just so exciting to know a surprise and you want to see their face. You want to be the one to divulge the information, right? Is it just me? Right? No? Right? There's just something. So I, I kind of liken that and I wonder if that's a little bit of what Jeremiah is talking about here. Where he's a prophet of God. He carries the word of the Lord. And because he is facing so much angst, so much animosity just for saying and doing what God says, he has this thought as he's on the couch. God, I mean, what if I stop saying anything? I don't even want to say it anymore. Cause... And then he catches himself. Just the thought of not saying what you told me to say burns inside of me. Just the thought of not doing what you put me on this earth to do. Just, uh, just uh, I can't. I got to let it out. And I just know maybe your name isn't Jeremiah. Maybe it is. But you aren't a prophet of old. But you do carry the word of the Lord. And you do have a purpose. And you do have an assignment on your life. And because you do, we got to let it out. If you're taking notes, I, I want to, I, I want to, call this, and at first we were going with, you can't shut me up, right? But then I thought about, I don't think you can have can't in a sermon title. So let's just say let it out, right? Because we don't want to be the negative side, although you, we can't be shut up, but we got to let it out, people. Come on, we got to let it out. And I just think there are a lot of things, a lot of reasons, a lot of challenges that we can individually face. I don't know each and every one of you individually. I don't know all that you've been through. I don't know your life. But I do know there's an assignment, and I do know there is a purpose for you. I do know there is a reason why you're here, and maybe you have yet to find that out. Maybe you have yet to hear God's voice. Maybe you have yet to put your faith in Jesus. But listen up, because the Holy Spirit is speaking tonight, and he has the answers you're looking for. Come on, he has the answers that you're looking for. Because you can't be shut up, and we are going to let it out. You know, there's all kinds of experiences that we have in life. That cause us to have, you know, our, our body, like you see like in nature, there are things create protection mechanisms, right? Like, like just if this starts to happen, I just, I'm just not going to go there. If I go to the edge, I learned last time, unless you're a baby, my daughter will fall off the bed and then get up and do it again, right? But as we get older, like you start to get your defense mechanisms so that you survive. Otherwise, how do you survive in life unless you kind of protect, put your protections? The challenge is that when Jesus get, made us a new creation, he, he, you know, remember, he made us a new creation. All, all the old has passed away. We have now become new. And now the defense mechanism, we put it in, right? Because we were like, oh, but I, I got to bring this with me, God, because I got to protect myself from those hurts. I got to protect myself from those people saying things. I got to protect myself from going down that road. When God is saying, if I lead you there, I'm going to take care of you. Right? But yet we're, we're still kind of like, uh, I got to do my, my defense mechanisms to see, keep me survived in life. And, and so we have our challenges. We think things happen to us and we allow ourselves to come up, even though we're believers, even though we're saved, but yet we have all these defense mechanisms around us. And all of a sudden it's like this mouse trap just to try to get into your life. And then you wonder, I don't have any godly friends. I don't have people in church that I know. So I just sometimes go and I leave early. And I, well, because you have all these contraptions just to say hello to you. Right? Because you put all your defense mechanisms and justified them. I, I, we're not here to beat you up. I promise. I promise this is, this is, this is going to get gooder and gooder. But I just, can, can we allow God to talk to us tonight? Can we allow the Holy Spirit to, to kind of examine us and, and show us and guide us? That's the, what the Word of God is for, right? Sharper than a two-edged sword. It can get into the lowliest of cracks to separate the bone from the marrow. That's what we're allowing the Word to do. So come on with me. Are we good? All right. Good. You know, I was, uh, I, was, I was on, you know, browsing the internet, surfing the internet the other day, and I saw this headline, and it was like, uh, Bieber slams Christians. Bieber slams Christians. Talking about Justin Bieber, right? So, like, you know, he's saved now, and like, it's this big deal. But this headline is like, Bieber slams Christians. So, 
like the clickbait that it is, I, you know, got me to click. I'm like, what, what is it? What's, what's he talking about? Maybe he's not a Christian after all. What, you know, like, you know, like I'm defending the faith right now. So I'm reading this Bieber headline and it said, oh yeah, the headline says Bieber slams Christian examples. And so I watched this little interview. Maybe some of you saw the interview um, that he did and uh, with the Apple Music guy, I forget his name, but uh, he's sitting there and, and he's talking to him about his faith and Christian Bieber, uh, Christian Bieber, Justin Bieber is talking about his faith and, you know, his relationship with Jesus. And he just makes a quick reference to that, hey, there was a time in his life he thought he was doing one thing, but he had some bad examples of some Christians who were kind of saying one thing and doing the other. But it wasn't anywhere near slamming Christians, right? But that title wanted you to know Christians are hypo hypocrites and dumb and stupid, and you'd be dumb to even think about becoming. That's what the title might as well have said, right? But can I tell you, we should not be surprised that the world is not in our corner. That the devil is not cheering for us. And I don't know if you think that Christianity is for wimps, but we got to put some thick skin on because we have to know that we are in for a fight. And if you thought, oh, Christians, they're like too safe or, yeah, those guys are kind of nerdy, right? Like I was a, I was a church kid and, and I, you know, I was probably not as cool as some of the, like the non, you know, like, oh, yeah, the bad boys and stuff like that. But I'm telling you, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I love, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, come on. So but <laughs> why did I bring that up? I don't know. But no, I know why. I know why. I know why. See, because we can't live in this idea that, like, just Christianity, and then we just skip through life now, and, oh, my gosh, I got born again, right? There are people, like, for no reason, I know this is the cheesy example, like, but the, the, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because the world doesn't want you to think that Christians are good or that being Christian or having faith is something that's beneficial to you in your life. The problem is people buy it. And that's what I, I, as a pastor, as someone who cares for people, not even just as a pastor, just as a Christian, I don't like to hear that someone's out there bullying other people away from putting their faith in Jesus. And you shouldn't either. That shouldn't settle well with you. You know, just like you, I mean, if you saw some kid beating up a smaller kid in the parking lot, you'd go over there and stop the fight. Right? Like it's just something, you don't want to see that. It's the same kind of thing when we see Christians trying to get pummeled and beat up and made fun of and trying to be belittled. And so what I, I, what I know the Holy Spirit wants to share with us tonight is the idea of being able to not get shut up. Not be getting shut up with experiences and challenges that we have in life, but being able to get into a place and a position to let it out. Look at your neighbor and say, let it out. I can't be shut up. Come on. Newsflash. It's never going to be completely safe for you to share the gospel. It wasn't for Jesus. He got stoned. And he, got, they, he, he, couldn't, he had to sneak out of towns because they were trying to kill him. It wasn't for the disciples. Some of them died a martyr's death. And it wasn't for the generations and over the thousands of years of people or for anyone who's ever made real kingdom impact. And I don't know about you, but I want to make an impact on the kingdom. I want to, I, I want to do what God would call me to do. And I have to, the sooner I embrace that what I'm called to is not the safest thing, then I think the better off we are because at least we can walk in our assignment. At least we can walk on the path that we're called to. And that path might not look pretty all the time, and it might not be easy, but it's the right path. So we're going to find the right path for your life. According to what the word says, not according to what your family does or your culture does or what society says to do, but the right path for you. Because I know there are people in this room who are just kind of like, I don't know, and that's perfectly okay. You don't have to have it all together. I don't have it all together. Pastor Dan, can I tell on you, Pastor Dan doesn't have it all together. Ooh, right? But the Holy Spirit, come on, guides us through our path. The Holy Spirit, God doesn't ask us to do something and say, I'll see you on the other side, maybe. You know, like, let's get through this together, son. Let's get this through together, daughter. Let's do this. All right? <laughs> when, when, when talking about living out loud, when talking about being in a place where we are going to let it out, we have to think about the other part of it, right? Identifying what shuts you up. What shuts you up? Number one, fear. Number one, fear. 
Now, there's a, there's a lot of things. You know, in, in studying and preparing for the message tonight, it's like, oh, well, you know, there's probably about 10, 15, 20 things just that I could quickly think of that can shut us up, that can shut us down. And by shutting up, I don't necessarily just mean our mouth. I mean, that can kind of put us into the proverbial closet of being closet Christians or not living out loud or not living in what we're supposed to be doing. They can get us off of our game, get us out of our purpose because uh, I, I just, no, no, something happened. But number one is fear. Fear. You know, I don't know if you guys ever remember maybe being in school. Anyone ever remember? Anyone go to school ever? No? Elementary, right? Okay. Maybe you were in school. Johnny, hey, or, or anyone, does anyone know what two times two is? And you were like, dude, I know this. Thinking you're all bad, raise your hand, teacher calls on you, E equals MC squared with full confidence, like you know the answer, and the answer is wrong. A and then everyone starts laughing at you. Like, and you're just embarrassed, you humiliated, you stepped out, you were, I mean, you understood the concept this time, finally, and you were going to get the answer right, and you got it wrong, and people made fun of you. What happened the next time you thought you knew the answer? I bet you didn't say it. Come on, I bet you didn't say the answer. I bet you didn't even raise your hand. I bet if the teacher even called on you, were like, nope, don't know it. Why? Because fear shut you up. Because fear tied your hands. Because your defense mechanism of being humiliated in front of people or being laughed at or made fun of paralyzed you. And as Christians... This happens to us all too often. As believers, or, or in general, fears that we have tie us from going everywhere that God has us to go. Oh, I tried that before. I stepped out in that way. Oh, oh can I talk about money real fast? Oh, I, I paid tithes that one time. And then, I, and then I couldn't pay the bills that month. Come on, but the Bible says the word shall not return void. The Bible says the righteous will not be forsaken or be seen begging for bread. But you just wanted to put in your, like, one-time tithe. Or you just wanted, like, you, you know, I put in some money one time. Or, or, you know, things that all of a sudden, and then you're fearful to ever step out again. Or I even went as far as I invited someone to church, and they laughed at me. So I never invited anybody else. I'll show you. Right? But fear can so paralyze us. And the only way that we can overcome fear, well, guess what? The, script, the scripture has a word for that. Is that okay? It's, look, we're not just, I'm not just talking up here my opinions, right? We're, we're talking about, let's see what the word has to say about this. Is that all right? Second Timothy, go with me, Second Timothy, chapter 1. Second Timothy, chapter 1. Paul is writing to a young Timothy. Everybody good? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We often stop there, but verse number 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Remember how we were talking about how God made you a new creation? So when God pieced us back together, guess one essential ingredient that he left out? Well, not essential, essential to your old self. He purposely left out one ingredient that we like to carry through, and that is fear. He has not given you spear, fear, but he gave you love, power, and a sound mind. Everything that you need to get what I called you to do, I put in you. Everything that you don't need, I left out. I didn't make any mistakes on you. That, that gift that you have, that, that talent that you have, I put them there. Those things that you think are flaws, I allowed them there as well. And there, you have a purpose, and now you have an assignment. Let's get going. Oh, oh, oh but this fear part, I got to bring with me. No, no, you were not getting, given the spirit of fear. But what does verse 8 say? So for the testimony's sake. And it even says, it even warns us that there will be stuff going on. Here's Paul talking as a prisoner. As a prisoner, I'm telling you, hey, don't be afraid. Imagine getting a letter from someone that's, that's locked up for life. And they're saying, hey, man, don't be afraid to do the same thing that I did that got me here. That's what he's telling Timothy. Because you haven't been given a spirit of fear. But you've given love, power, and a sound mind. But yet we like to keep our fears because 
Can we be honest? Sometimes our fears keep us feeling safe. Because as long as I fear that, now, we, we, we can sometimes make up positive reasons for fear, right? Like, you know, fear the water. Like, I, I, I've taught my son, and now he doesn't go as far in the water with me anymore at the beach. Because he just took one time, and like the wave just, and my wife got all mad. Like, why did you let him do that? Like, he needs to learn. <laughs> respect the water. Respect the water. Now, don't fear the water, but respect the water. Because the water will not, come on now. I, I, I know how to swim fairly well. And I've been body surfing my whole life and, and all that stuff. And I just love the beach. But you got to respect the water. The moment you don't, boom, face, I, I, dislo I dislocated my shoulder, had a couple surgeries. Like I was trying to body surf. The water is a bad mamma jamma. Come on now. It's like, what, 90% of the earth is water? Respect the water. But we don't fear these things. You get what I'm saying? So there are things that we understand, and we like to give them names of, like, fear. I'm just gonna, I, I fear that because you know, there's one thing to understand how things work, but we don't have to keep fear. You know, it, I, oh, I, I, I'm not going to fear my boss, so I'm just going to let him know everything I, I feel. No, no, no. Respect your boss. That person can hire and fire you. You don't cuss him out just because you feel like it. But you don't fear him because God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. So if the Lord prompts you to say or do something, then you do it according to what he is saying. You get what I'm saying? So let's not carry pet fears with us thinking that, oh, these, this is wisdom. This is a smart thing to do. But remember, fear was not put in us. So we shouldn't have it available to glean from. You get what I'm saying? Amen. Fear of consequence, rejection, humiliation, none of that is for us. None of that is something, although, again, it's our defense mechanism. It keeps us from, uh, from feeling afraid or getting hurt again. But that, none of that is for given to us as believers. Because can I tell you, you know, oh, I, don't, I don't share my faith because I'm, I'm afraid that I'll get rejected or get marked or, or I, I, just, I just can't. Can I, can I tell you? That you, oh, come on, people do some silly things for money. People do, I mean, have you ever been to a, like a sports game? You do like, oh, I'll, to get on the, on, the, on the kiss cam, you'll do whatever to get like on the dance, you know when they're showing like people dancing? You are doing moves that you never, come on now, you've seen some of these gifts that you don't want to become a gift. Want, who's on a gift? Anybody in here, on a, like you're on, if I search dancing, it's, you're going to pop up. No? Anyone? Because you see the crazy things people do. For a little money, a little prize, a little pat on the back. And you can't invite someone to church because you might get rejected. Did you see yourself on the screen? You're, people are laughing not with you but at you, bro. Like, it's not a, oh, man, it's all right. You guys don't want to have fun tonight. Anybody all right? <laughs> man, fear is not for you. Fear can shut you up. We overcome that by understanding. It's not perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. And God has first loved us, and we have love in our lives. If you're a born-again believer, you have been, you are loved. And the perfect love that you have can cast out any fear, any doubt, anything that you, that try to rise up inside of you to keep you from your purpose, to keep you from your destiny is just, come on, we got to push that out. I will not be shut up. I will not be shut up. I'm going to let it out. Come on, anybody want to let it out tonight? Number two, offense. Ooh. Offense. Offense will shut you up real quick. Got real quiet, too. Because sometimes we don't want to acknowledge we are offended. Because if we acknowledge we're offended, then we acknowledge that maybe we care. And you don't want to care because then you feel silly for caring when that person hurts you or offended you. But the reality is, we can live our life, and the moment that we're letting someone else, letting the offense come up, or the wall that we've built now from ha letting this happen, we, we can decide to shut this down. And maybe this happens in church. You know, you tried to come out and sing, or you tried to serve in a certain area. Maybe you didn't get a call back, or maybe it didn't work out the way you thought. Or maybe, to be honest, something just happened. Your number got lost, but you're offended now because, oh, they, didn't, they don't like me. Or they did that background check and they must, have, they must judge me now. No, 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 we lost your number, dude. Like, but that offense is now, well, I'm not serving there anymore. Oh, you don't want me on that time? 
Well, then you know what? Keep the whole thing. I don't want it. Come on, can we be real in church? And maybe it's not just volunteering, but where in your life? Look, you know you have, you've come to grips. I have a purpose. You, you understand you have an assignment. You've been around church long enough to know that God has given you gifts and talents that you want to use as badly as God wants you to use them for his kingdom. Cool. But then you get ready, you get ready to go, and then something happens that offends you, that hurts you. And all of a sudden, you know what, I don't know about that whole thing anyways. I'm going to try completely do ministry. That's not what's for me. And what happens is, again, it paralyzes us. It shuts us up from what we are called to do. Why am I beating this point home? Because I don't know, you know, the, the Lord was just really stirring this message up in my heart. Because so quickly, we can let things just rise up, even within me. That just like, you know what, I'll, I'll just bow out. I'll just bow out. Like, I'm good. I, I don't need to do that. But then, you know what, when we do, not only, I, I learned a couple things. When we do that, when we just bow out or just like, you know what, I'm cool, it's all good. They don't need me. That's an extra person. Or, you know, we can make up all kinds of excuses that make us look all humble and, and like cool, right? Like, oh, psh, you don't need me anyways. I'm good, right? Come on. <laughs> oh, we're being too real? Right? Is it just me? I was like, oh, psh, I'm good. That's all. It's all. Psh. Maybe that's what lost you, the psh. Maybe you don't do psh. Maybe, I don't know what it is for you, but for me, psh, whatever. But then, you know, you, then you say, I'm out. I'm, I move on. I'm going to just bow out. But, so here we are. We over-spiritualize the reason why we think we needed to do that. But what we just did is we tied the hands of going forward with our destiny, tied the hands of finding our purpose. But, man, I just, it's kind of like I, I find all, all the messages that God gives me, I, I just I really burn with this desire about helping people find and know their purpose in life. Because when we can do that, first of all, what, there's, you'd be surprised how many people don't believe that they have any purpose. Or that are kind of lost about like, Psh, I'm, here I go again, Psh, just going through life. But when we can understand we have purpose, it ignites a fire within us. See, like Jeremiah, that, that fire that's burning, that's not just because he had a cool title of prophet. It's because he knew that there was something on the inside of him, just like there's something on the inside of you. And that that thing can ignite. Man, it can get you through challenges. It can get you through fear. And it can get you through offense. Let's look at the word of God. Look at the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse number 3. I'm going to read out of the NLT. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. See, you, you can be hurt and offended with someone or something really quickly. You, you didn't get picked on a team on a, for a project at work, and then all of a sudden you're not, you don't want to be on the team at all. And you're offensive. But then we miss this part of the scripture that is saying, make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit. That means if it didn't work out the first time, we'll make an effort to make it work out. The onus isn't on the other person. They offended you. So let the person who offended you try to make unity. No, you make every effort. See, because we will stand before the Lord. Come on, we will all stand before the Lord. And we can't give an excuse of, you know, I didn't fulfill my, my, fulfill my purpose because when I was going to do that one thing, that guy just he got in the way or this happened. I, I, I was all set to go. And then they told me I couldn't sing. And my purpose was to sing. And so I was lost. So I just, you know, they're bad. No, this, this is not how it works. See, but, but we can let our offense do that. It builds a wall. It, it, it builds, it, it can shut down the lane for our purpose. Number three, last one. I know I, there, there are, again, like I said, there are so many different reasons. And I, I'm just hitting a few of them that, I just, I, like, again, the Holy Spirit just really was stirring up these few. And then as we close here pretty soon, I want to make sure that we have a moment where God can speak to you. Because, I, I, you know, we, we often talk about breaking chains of the bondage that we're in, maybe it's specific sins or things like that. But I, I believe tonight that God wants to remove the muzzle. 
Remove the muzzle of, of being shut up. Remove the muzzle uh, of letting other things stop us. Okay, but here we go. We'll do, we'll do that. Pick that up in just a little bit. Jared, I'm going to ask you to come back out. I don't know if you're in the back or where you're at in a little bit here. Number three, comparison. If you're taking notes, we talked about fear. We talked about offense. And number three, comparison. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, popular set of verses here. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne. I want to look at a couple words in there. See, because we see, let us run the race of endurance that was set before us. Look, we're in this together. Not, he didn't say the race that was set before me, the race that was set before us. The race had been set before us. We, we're family. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We know the calling. It's a group assignment. Hey, who likes group assignments? Not the introverts, right? But we're in this together, right? We, but guess what? Even in a race, everyone has their lane. And then what do we see in the, in the next part? The race set before us, keeping your eyes on your teammate, the person next to you. No, keeping your eyes on Jesus. Number three, comparison. Comparison can shut you up really quickly. See, because we took our eyes off of Jesus and we're looking at how spiritual someone else is or what they don't struggle with that you know you do. You know, have you ever been like, you were about to come, you're like, oh man, I can't wait. Go, go, go tell my friends about what I did this weekend or what kind of new shoes I got or whatever it might be. And then before you can get your word in, there's tops yours. And then you're just like, wah, wah, I'm like now. Like, I can't say anything now. Like, oh my gosh, guys, guess what? I booked a weekend to go to San Diego. They're like, I'm going to Paris this week. Yeah. And you're like, oh, cool. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Right? But it's just like, it, it feels like it blows yours out of the water. And then that comparison, what you were excited about and nothing actually changed about what was going to happen, or you still got the shoes, you still got the vacation, you still got the promotion, you're still making that amount, but it only got smaller or degraded or downgraded by the comparison to someone else. And then what happened? You, uh, yours just wasn't a big deal anymore. And then your purpose, your destiny, your assignment feels like, I, I, I get, maybe, maybe I'm not needed at all. Maybe I'm not needed. Can I be honest with you? Where's Pastor Joe? Pastor Joe, I, I was, when I first came on staff, Pastor, me and Pastor Joe, about a month apart, he's a little bit older than me, old man. <laughs> he's, a little, he's a month older than me. And so we were kind of coming up together. And I remember we'd go to lunch. When I was first on staff, we'd hang out. He was a pastoral assistant. I was Pastor Joel's assistant. But Pastor Joe, like he was like a walking Bible. The dude was like a walking Bible. You know, I'd like share parts of my testimony. <laughs> we have an inside joke with some friends. Like while we were like out doing things in the world, Pastor Joe was at the altar praying, fasting, and reading his Bible. Right? Like we're out knee deep in our sin, going to hell and not even caring at the time. Pastor Joe was interceding for us. <laughs> and I would get intimidated, man. I would get intimidated. I, you know, Pastor Joe, like, man, he's so holy. Or like, if I, I, had a, I remember I had a, a cousin come into town. And I, I know he was some struggling with some stuff. And I was like, oh, man, I, I wanted to help him. But I was like, I, I, I can't. So, Pastor Joe, will you come meet, come meet with me and my cousin? We're going to go to coffee. Come, I just, hey, do your thing, Pastor Joe. You know, like, do your thing. Save him. I can't. Right? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? <laughs> and I just remember feeling like this intimidation factor. And then, you know, I would work in young adults. I mean, this is not about Pastor Joe, and Pastor Joe's not perfect. You know, don't put him on a shrine. But I, there's just, is it, am I alone? Maybe you know somebody. 
They just, they just seem so much further than where you're at. They just seem so much more skilled, so much more able than where you are at. And that, cons- that, that comparison just can keep you like, oh, I just, I can't. But then one day, I, I just got into the word of God on my own. Pastor Joe wasn't there. I read the Bible. Pastor Joe wasn't there with me. But you know, the Bible shall not return void. And you know, when you start reading the Bible, it gets inside. And maybe you don't feel like you're making any traction. I didn't memorize a verse this week. Uh, I, didn't, I don't have that Bible study. Pastor Joe is still doing his thing over there. Or my friend, they, they've gone to church five times this week. But you know what? You're, as you get in your relationship, you're reading the Bible, you're praying. All of a sudden, it just starts sticking. Then before you know it, you have a conversation, and the word comes out of you. You're like, what the heck? And you just bless someone. You just prophesied over them. You just told them what the word says about them. You just encourage somebody. And like, whoa, but Pastor Joe wasn't here to do it for me. The person that you compare yourself to wasn't there, and God can use you. And Pastor Dan didn't, get, didn't lead everyone in your family to the Lord at Thanksgiving. I called him, but he didn't answer. So I just, the word I knew, the prayer that I said, you know what? God used it. Oh, my gosh. The assignment, the purpose, the calling on your life matters it's valuable and it's not to be compared to someone else because while we are on the same team the race set before us we are keeping our eyes on Jesus we are keeping our eyes forward on Jesus as we run this race and we cheer each other on doesn't matter if someone else is in a lane ahead of you because guess what we're all gonna win we're all on the same team if they win you win If I win, you win. If you win, they win. Come on. We're on the same team. We don't need to compare, but yet it just seems so like, oh, man, they're just so spiritual. And the the problem is is we use it because we feel like if if we had that situation, that would make our life easier because we know Jesus is the answer, right? So what we're doing is we're actually comparing the Jesus in them. But, you know, it's not a different Jesus, It's not a different God that they serve than the God you serve. It's not like I need to rub off, I need to get around this guy so he can rub off on me. As much as what it it did was encourage me because I didn't want Pastor Joe's brain in my brain. What I really want, what I was attracted to, what I was comparing myself was the God inside him. What I was comparing myself was the time and, and devotion that he spent in the word and in prayer. And guess what? All I had to do for free was go in my room and pray more. And read more and get into a relationship. Not because I'm more spiritual or I have more hours and, and that's what. But it's because you spend time with Jesus. And guess what? It's enough. Time with the Lord is enough to equip you. We can always add more time. We can always put more devotion time. But as you chip away, I'm telling you. Now I don't even call Pastor Joe. <laughs> Pastor Joe, man. You were not in my notes, my brother, but still. I just love Pastor Joe so much. That's why. But look, comparison is just going to keep us down. And we do it all the time in the natural. But what I'm talking about tonight is the spiritual. But it's the same concept for the natural. They're smarter. They have more money. They have a different thing. And the reason why I want to now bring up some of the things that we talk about as natural is because you guys walk out of here and some of you tomorrow, you start your jobs. You go to your careers that you would call in the natural, but that is your mission field. And you have to walk into your place of work knowing who you are in Christ. You have to walk into your place knowing that you have Jesus on your side. You have a purpose, you have an assignment where you are at. That's your mission field. Like Pastor Dan hit so well this weekend. Man, such a good word, such a good message on getting out there and making what you are doing is your ministry to where you're at. But you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt if you're just comparing yourself to the next person. Or I wish I had those skills or those talents or that ability. Now, the ability that you do have is what God has you and he wants to continue to, and to grow you. Come on, if, you, if you're not good at reading, there are some things in the practical. Start practicing reading, right? And you'll, you'll become a better reader. It's not like God just will zap you and all of a sudden, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to learn a new language, unless God supernaturally does that, like, you have to take courses and classes, right? Does that make sense? 
But God has a purpose and a plan, and it has nothing to do with the comparison of your neighbor. You know, as iron sharpens iron, and we talk about making it perf- in, the, in the last thing, being purposeful about being and finding unity. But comparison is the opposite of unity for us. All right. Like I said, hey, Jared, you can come on out, and we're going to play the keys now. And I, want <laughs> I, I want to take some time before we leave. Anyone get anything out of the Word of God today? This is great. It's great to get a few points. Maybe you wrote them down. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you already forgot them. But fear, comparison, that's going to hurt you. Offense is going to keep you quiet. Maybe you already forgot them. But what I believe is that some of you walked in with the muzzle on. And again, maybe it's not over your mouth. It's just kind of over your life where you just, you've been shut up. Maybe it's by one of these things that we named or maybe it's, again, several others. But you've been hurt. Life has taught you I better not. I better not live my life on purpose. I better not tell people about my faith. I better not really walk out or try this new gift set. Some of you have businesses inside of you, but there's, you've just been afraid for so long because if you tell your family what you have dreams of, then you feel like they're going to talk you out of it. Start those businesses in Jesus' name. Go back to school. Those are real talents. That musical ability you have, like, pursue it. Practice. But the muzzle's been on you. And you, you can't help but feel, like, this is of God. Like, when I do this, it just... It feels right. Well, you know what that feeling is? That's God saying, I'm, I'm on that. So pursue it. Don't be afraid of it. But the muzzle's on, and it shuts you up. It keeps you from walking in your purpose. It keeps you from walking in your assignment. And you wonder why, like, oh, my gosh, I have all this exterior success. People are comparing themselves to me, but I'm so unsettled. Maybe you've been shut up in an area. And you've been more concerned about earthly success. But this pays great right now. Or I get a lot of accolades right now. And if I go do that, then I don't know. People might not like me. I might have to get rid of my car. I might have to, I don't know. Can I tell you by the Spirit of God, God is calling you to that area. I'm not saying quit your job. And I, I, God is calling you to be obedient. Can I clarify? Trust the voice inside of you that, that is God leading you to doing what you've been called to do. Because there's just that unsettling and it's no fun. I, I want to pray for you. It's just a prayer for that. Can we stand really quickly? I, I just want, I want to pray. And if that is you, you know, you, you don't have to raise your hands or do anything special. But just receive this prayer. You've been muzzled too long. You've been handcuffed too long to fear, to offense, to comparison, to a myriad of other things that have kept you quiet, that have kept you from living out your purpose, that have kept you from your call. And I don't know about you. It's not just this weekend, but this church, this house has a purpose and a call of its own, and you are blessed to be here. I don't just say that because, like, this is an awesome house, and we are going great things. And the reason why is because of you. The reason why is because of the gifts and callings that are inside of you. Not because of the gifts and callings of this stage, but the people who are in these seats, the businesses that are in these seats, the impact that is in this room right now that fill these seats on a weekend service. That is what makes this house so special. Because together we believe that the Inland Empire shall be saved. And guess what? You have a part of it. You are a key role in the mission of this house. Heavenly Father, I just come before you and I pray, Lord God, that the muzzles would fall tonight. You kept giving me this term in prayer, the muzzle would fall. That we would not be tied down, bogged down by fear, by offense, by comparison, by anything that would keep us from doing and being all that you have called us to be. So we thank you, Jesus, and we pray that it 
is broken tonight, that we leave this place free, Jesus. Holy Spirit, that you just go and touch the hearts, encourage those hearts, reassure those minds that you are doing a new work. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.